So my name is Ivan Inoka, I'm a senior researcher at RISE, the National Research Institute here in Sweden. And this is my colleague. Oh, Sachiko. Uh, Sachiko Muto, I'm a colleague of Johan's, a senior researcher at uh, RISE as well. And I'm also the chairperson of an organization called Open Forum Europe. And we've both been working, researching, collaborating with uh, both public sector industry and open source for I think for me about 10 years you since 2007 yeah, yeah. So, sometime um, so this is basically the, the findings or summary of a uh, work we did for the Danish agency for digital government looking at how open source software can be used as an instrument for software reuse um, this can be done for many many rationales many incentives but they basically wanted to get into how, both in the general sense, how public sector can be better in using open source as a lever for, as a means for software reuse, as a tool in an instrument in their digital transformation. Both from the practical side, like how do you go about it, but also from the policy side, how can you regulate it or enable it through policy measures. Um, and very specifically as input to Denmark's ongoing work uh, both between the Agency for Digital Government, the Kansas Dilsen, and their uh, national, what do you call it, uh, local government Denmark, or National Association of uh, Local Governments, or comparable to, comparable, comparable to SKR in, in Sweden. Uh, so they wanted input to their national work and a potential open source strategy for Denmark. And hopefully this can provide input to other countries as well, such as Sweden. So what we did was that we identified 16 countries through different digital maturity indices, such as OECD uh, and from the EU and UN. And we identified 16 countries globally, including, for example, Japan, South Korea, Colombia, New Zealand, and uh, several European, European countries, so we try to be as diverse as possible. Um, and then we, we, uh, we, surveyed, we surveyed these for, for example, in terms of um, what kinds of policies they have in place, how are they governed, who owns them, how are they structured, how do they enable software reuse or promote the use of open source in, in this case. And how is this supported through policy measures or policy support actions? Um, and we we'll also look for different success cases and so on. Um, and the findings, we compiled 16 case studies. So if you go into, use the QR code, you can go into the report. And then you can actually go in and see, see the countries that we surveyed. And actually go in and look for each country, how they go about, how they promote open source within their public sector both in Sweden and Denmark, um, yeah, and the other countries I mentioned. So you can go in and actually compare between the countries to get a, a high level overview. Uh, and with that, I'll leave it over to you. Right, so... So, you yeah, I didn't uh, specifically go into, I think, um, the... We didn't list all the countries that were involved, but um, I mentioned uh, in the beginning that I've been looking at public policies for open source um, software since about uh, 2007. And um, I've also been involved in some other um, studies um, that looked at um, public policies um, concerned with open source. And um, the, the difference with this one, I think, was really interesting because of the the research question that we had led to this sampling, which wasn't based on sort of look at some interesting examples of open source policies in the world, but rather we looked at sort of which countries are ranked consistently ranked high in some of these um, indexes um, that looked at digital government and, and sort of digital maturity. And that led to this quite interesting sample, and for me, even though I've looked at these um, issues for a long time, uh, led to some surprising findings, I think. And um, I have a political science background, so um, I, um, um, we don't go into really sort of um, here about what is a policy, 
and uh, what's the difference between sort of a stated policy and, and, and you know, the implementation of a policy and then sort of what does it look like, does this actually translate into practice, etc. Here we have specifically looked at sort of um, quite a wide range of policy documents ranging from sort of uh, guidance documents, uh, actual legislation, um, sort of more white, you know, government white papers, etc. But in all cases, um, they should be sort of um, somehow adopted by a central government or um, some other authoritative body. And it should be some explicit mention of, um, of open source uh, software or, or, um, or software we use. And um, what we found, I think, um, and, and there I should say that, so we don't, in this study, explicitly look at sort of how this policy then has translated into actual, uh, or whether it has translated into actual practice. And uh, I think one interesting example is to look at Estonia, for example, where it's often presented as um, a country who, who has built its sort of uh, widely uh, admired, um, highly digital um, sort of uh, country uh, that it, it's built on open source. But if you look at policies, explicit policies mentioning open source, there are actually not that many. So they has been driven sort of more by, um, uh, not policy driven, but more kind of, um, I guess, practically driven. So um, with that intro, um, we looked at 16 quite um, diverse countries and found, uh, of course, quite some diversity, uh, but still, um, you know, we're able to, to group these countries, um, um, uh, you know, uh, there are some discernible criteria that allow us to, to group these countries in some ways. And the, the most interesting for me, actually, one of the most interesting for me was this kind of what we term internal versus external um, uh, focus of the policies. And I think, I think most people in this room, I guess, are from Sweden or from Europe, I don't know how many people we have from a sort of from international um, backgrounds, but um, when I have personally been involved in advocating for uh, for public policies to mention open source, it has actually been about um, you know I'm sure a lot of people here are um, familiar with the sort of the public money public code um, arguments etc. So I've been focused on the government's own use of open source software. Um, and what we found in quite in a small subset of countries, uh, namely the, the, the Asian countries that, that you have mentioned, is that the focus has been more on, on sort of the, the tech sector use of open source in, in that country. And so a more um, interventionist industrial policy. So we looked at um, especially in South Korea, it has been since the early 2000s actually, um, a quite um, active government policy promoting open source but in its own tech sector. And um, so long-standing policy and you know, even as recently as last year, uh, there was a public statement from the, from the Korean government to say we need to have 200,000 open source programmers um, in the next several years and it's sort of the government gets involved in funding and promoting um, the, the sort of um, these kinds of education programs and, 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 and these efforts. Um, but most of the countries that we looked at and that we are familiar with, um, they do focus on this internal um, aspect which has to do with procurement policies and also um, as I mentioned, you know, if public money has been used or, um, to, or tax f uh, funding has been used to, to develop code, then it should be sort of released also as, um, as uh, open source software. And so this, is, this refers to the, the, um, uh, the second distinction that we found, which has to do with this inbound versus outbound um, focus. And this is if we look at the, the private sector, um, we often hear these terms consumption versus 
contribution, and, and I guess this is um, mirrors a little bit, but is is still different, I think, in the public sector um, um, context. But we see then countries having uh, some countries having both an inbound um, policy and an outbound policy. Um, countries where um, where we see that there's a longer history of having policies on open source, like the UK, for example, they often start out um, as focusing specifically on inbound. We talk, we talk about procurement. This was sort of the first wave of open source policies that um, were linked a lot to sort of in the in the aftermath of the financial crisis in, in 2007 or 2008. Um, there was a lot of focus on sort of procurement and and um, and better use of, of um, government funds. Um, we see some more recent policies um, looking at more this, um, taking on more this more argument about sort of that code that has been developed with, with public funds that it should be, um, be published in, in open source or should at least be made so that it's reusable for other public sector organizations. So we have um, 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 and sometimes these are in, you know, they are handed in the, in the same policy or sometimes there are different policy instruments or documents that talk about um, the different, uh, the inbound versus the outbound. Um, we also saw um, different groupings when it comes to the type of policy intervention and the sort of the level of prescriptiveness. Um, so sometimes, you know, you get um, you have maybe an incoming government um, that um, that makes a very high level endorsement of open source. Um, so, for example, in, in Luxembourg, where there is a sort of the incoming government um, publishes a high level document and it talks about an intention to make more use of open source. Sometimes these documents they don't translate into. Um, more specific uh, guidelines or specific uh, legislation, but it sort of remains um, as, a, as a high level endorsement. Um, and in the cases where we have more specific policies or legislation that talks about um, open source, they also differ in terms of how prescriptive they are. Um, some, um, in some countries you see guidelines that talk about just highlighting um, the potential benefits of open source and, and, and more generally say that it's something that should be considered uh, or might be considered um, by public sector organizations. And then you have the examples um, often mentioned, for example, in France and the Netherlands, where you have sort of uh, I wouldn't say that it's, it's, you know, sometimes you talk about mandatory use. There's often at least a sort of um, a high level of preference for open source where there. It's stated that, you know, open source should be the, the you know, considered in the first instance. Um, but there's, of course, always um, a sort of a possibility to, to, um, uh, to choose another alternative. Um, but it should at least be sort of considered in, um, in the first instance. And you also have, for example, in the, in the UK, I think it's like that as well, where it's sort of seen as um, the default choice, um, at least if you read um, government documents. Um, right, and so we also make this distinction, I think, whether it's um, uh, a document, a piece of legislation that has actually gone through um, adoption through the democratic process and sort of have been all adopted by a, a national legislative body. So you have in the Netherlands and France some quite well-known examples where there is an actual law uh, that spells out, um, uh, you know, this preference for open source uh, use by public sector organizations. Um, you can also have, as in the UK, that it's um, been a document or guidelines lines that have been adopted directly by um, an authoritative body such as the cabinet office uh, in the UK. And so it's more an internal document that describes how the public sector should 
you know, um, uh, should function when it develops uh, digital services, for example. Um, we also talk about the scope. So um, this is maybe uh, sometimes they apply more broadly to. Um, uh, we are focused mainly on when there's a national scope. So. Uh, you have a document that maybe applies um, to all central government um, uh, bodies or sometimes uh, there is a sort of, uh, like in the UK again I mentioned that um, their guidelines uh, uh, apply to the central government but are, are also seen as good practice for, for all sort of um, publicly funded, let's say, um, institutions. Um, then I think, especially in the case where there isn't such a broad um, or national, nationwide um, policy or legislation, we looked at some specific examples where um, specific public sector organizations have, uh, may have adopted um, a policy that only applies to that specific body. Um, we also looked um, at some major cities, for example, that have um, adopted such policies, and then of course they only apply to to that uh, to that specific city. I'm gonna. I'm not used to this uh, cascade. I'm gonna just click. Okay, that's why I need the back button. Okay. Um, so, what sort of arguments um, are, are, are seen as valid for um, arguing for, for, for or provide a rationale for these, for these policies. Um, again, um, I think in, in almost all the cases we looked at, there is some, um, there is some mention of economic factors. Um, and I think I made this distinction earlier about sort of uh, when these policies, when, when they stem from. And I think if we look at some of these policies that were adopted earlier, um, so, you know, uh, from 2008 to, you know, to around 2018, um, there was um, a an, an clear emphasis on economic arguments. And often it's not just economic arguments often, you know, policy documents draw from, from a range of, um, uh, of factors and, and sort of pro provides a range of, of arguments for, 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 for these policies. But, but um, you can see that in documents that were adopted earlier, there was more emphasis on, on economic arguments. And, there, um, within those, um, so we're talking about sort of avoiding double spend, um, preventing lock-in, and promoting a competitive market. And I think there is a, even though you can say that there is a, economic arguments always there, they, they do differ in terms of how they are, logic, how those arguments are logically constructed. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a focus, um, purely on this notion that the government shouldn't pay twice for the same solution. So you see explicitly that mentioned in Spain, Colombia, UK for example, where it says the government pays for the solution, it should become a public software that any, any other government institution can, can reuse. And often then um, it's more focused on reuse and it's not specifically um, sort of explicitly uh, mentioned that it should be open source, but you know, more uh, focus on this, on this public sector reuse. Um, then you sometimes also see this argument about, which is more focused on uh, individual um, organizations and their procurement and has to do with this lock-in argument that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, that, you know, which, which often talks about sort of specific public sector organizations getting locked into specific vendors and, and that this can become costly, etc. And then, you know, this argument can also be taken to sort of that open source can promote competition, um, 
making you know procurement contracts open and available for more vendors to compete, etc., and that this can translate into lower prices eventually. So you see a kind of different types of arguments, but all um, having this sort of economic focus. Now, um, in, in a number of countries, we see um, that the European interoperability framework and sort of this adoption of national interoperability frameworks, that that process has really been a driver. Uh, one case um, is Estonia, um, where they have had a national interoperability framework in place uh, for um, over 10 years. Um, and it has been sort of more driven Initially, open source was just mentioned as, as a way to promote interoperability and the focus was always about having seamless um, e-government services and, uh, and you know, the, the, the driving force was to achieve this sort of uh, yeah, um, better digital services and the open source was just one way of, of, of achieving that. Um, digital sovereignty. Um, in the sort of bubble that I exist in, it seems like that's what everybody's talking about these days. Um, I realize that that's probably a, a, a sort of a EU digital policy bubble because um, it's not one of the... We did not see that in so many of the, the countries that this was so prominent. Uh, France is an example where that has, uh, has, um, has figured. Um, also, it has been the driving force behind specific, um, specific uh, initiatives. Um, we have one in Sweden, this um, collaboration that some of you may know about ESAM, which is a kind of collaboration between different public sector organizations to develop sort of digitally sovereign alternatives to some of the uh, you know, communication tools that the public sector um, is using. Um, we also saw that, for example, in Luxembourg, where there was a, there's been an open source uh, tool that has been developed uh, for, uh, for chat. Um, security is often mentioned uh, in open source policies, sometimes Sometimes it's mentioned as a way, as an example of where open source, um, there can be an exception to the to this uh, preference for open source. So it's kind of open source is viewed as potentially less secure. Um, in other cases, and you know, we see specific examples of um, cybersecurity uh, agencies like in Luxembourg and France, for example, being sort of a front runner in the country when it comes to open source and developing, um, um, you know, and taking quite an active role in, in the security of open source software. Transparency um, is another argument that's, that's often uh, mentioned, um, and there it's it goes beyond this sort of focus on just um, transparent use of, of, um, of uh, taxpayer money. It has to do with more um, providing transparency of the code. It is, is an extension of sort of um, open government uh, in general. Um, and you often see, it's an interesting case for me, I never thought, looked at Colombia before. There, open source has been promoted a lot, um, really to kind of promote and increase trust um, between uh, the government and and um, and the not just the citizens but but the private sector, and as a way to promote more uh, collaboration. Um, so um, there, you know, open source becomes part of uh, of a bigger concept, uh, the bigger concept of open innovation. Um, and uh, again, in Luxembourg, for example, that was, a, that, was uh, that came out uh, quite clearly, that it's something that, um, the ones that they are wanting to um, promote this sort of government, private sector collaboration and co-creation, um, which we didn't see so many, in so many places, but um, 
least in some places. And, you know, I could talk about this um, all day, but now we get into the more nitty gritty thing. Yeah, so it's it's quite interesting because a lot of the things we saw was really from the early 2000s, 2000 to 2001, 2002, this first wave of policies saying really, yeah, we should use open source and so on and so forth. But then they died out and then they bubbled up again with some call for action in, in the parliament, then they died out. So it's really, in a lot of cases, we saw these silence curves about policy initiatives, now we need to consider open source that uh, dissipates and then comes up again and then dissipates. And what we could see, it really ties into yeah, the, the uh, attention that the general question gets in how open source can be used and if it's tied to one individual, if it's tied to some broader extension of those in power or discuss, discussing these, these, these actions. But it's also about it's one thing saying, okay, we should use or you should consider this, but how? Um, so we, we could just mention Italy, even though Italy was not part of our investigation, we know that they have had a law since I think it was 2012, mandating that they should release everything as open source and should consider open source first hand. But there was no one knew how that implied, what that implied in practice, how to apply procurement laws, how to do a cost-benefit analysis, how to compare apples and oranges, or open and close, and how to compare the security between different open alternatives. It wasn't until they developed the, their procurement guidelines in 2020 like that, that they actually saw someone obliging by their national law. Um, so it's really important that what we could see that there are um, support actions in place, so it's not just a document laying there in some digital archive that people refer to, but isn't really used. People, people know about it, but yeah, but everyone has this silent understanding, yeah, there is that law, but no one understands what that means, so we don't, don't really care about it. If no one cares about it, no, not, no one is going, going to get hurt. So, one thing we saw across the cases was this use of an establishment of an open source program office. So an open source program office is a term originating from the tech industry beginning of the 2000s. Basically it's a, a, some kind of center of competency, some support function. Typically with the original within, from the industry context within a company, within an organization. But we, we saw these organizational constructs also in the public sector. Not, in very few cases they actually call themselves hospitals, but if we just take that label and look at it for what it is, it's some kind of organization, some kind of group of people working uh, strategically in trying to support implementation and people using and obliging by these policies promoting open source in terms of the use. So we could, we could find these both on, on one hand on the national government level, for example, within, uh, uh, typically within the agencies for digital government, like in uh, Iceland, uh, the digital Iceland, and, and in France, in Dinum, where they really have this overarching um, um, role to, to support the different public administrations in both using and contributing and collaborating on open source. Uh, we can also find, on, also on the local and regional level, looking at Spain, for example, which has quite autonomous regions. And again, looking back, it was quite focused on consumption and use. So in the beginning of the 2000s, there was a lot of focus on really seeing that the different IT services, platforms and applications were in, the lo in their local languages. So this was a way to enable that, those translations and maintain some kind of regional sovereignty, promoting their own regional industries. Um, we can also see these more association-based OSPOs, which basically are public sector open source foundations, you could call it. Like in Denmark, there is one called OS2, where, which has about 80 out of 90 municipalities and, and as members. They have about between 25 to 30 different open source projects that they have in, 
collaboratively initiated, developed, and used in collaboration with um, an ecosystem of open source vendors. There is, um, in uh, France, there's a somewhat uh, corresponding uh, association called Agilact. There's some Rück in Sweden who's moving towards that direction. Um, this really help the municipalities and those less capable to, to become part of something bigger so that the municipalities or the, these public administrations can pool their resources. Because in Sweden, I think the smallest municipality in Sweden has about 2,000 uh, inhabitants and the biggest one has about 1 million. And you can't expect a city of 2,000 people have the resources to, to know what open source is, what open source licenses. And as history has proven, a city of 1 million inhabitants, at least in the context of Sweden, isn't necessarily more capable than that. But still, coming together, you, you can get a much more higher power. Um, and we, we can also see these ASPAs or support functions also within specific administrations or ministries and so on. And then we also have these, you could call it translations of the policy into actual wordings. Okay, but how do you actually, okay, so now we're going to acquire an open source solution. How should we evaluate the vendors? How should we evaluate the security? How do we compare that with proprietary options, so on and so forth? And then the outbound context, how do we release this as open source? What checklist should we go on, go, go through? Just as in any tech company, you have these processes, so at least you should have them in some way. Okay, if we release something, this is the decision process. These are the hygiene factors that need to be in place. We shouldn't open source this, we open source that. Really supporting these public administrations to know, okay, but how can we abide by the policy? How can we consider open source, both in dissemination and in use? And then we have this more really connecting into the environment. So not just staying isolated, but creating these communities of practice and networks between the public sector entities, but also towards the external environment. If we look in, in there are examples, for example, in Malta and Spain, where these networks have been very close between, between the public sector organizations. But then we have also examples like Sweden, where we have NOSAT, the network of open source and data, um, where we have it's focused on, on public sector, but it's very broad in the sense that anyone can join. And then we have in France, for example, we have the Blue Hats, which is very broad in the sense that they are spanning across civil society, industry, civil hackers, and the public sector, tying everyone together, enabling knowledge sharing, training, initiation, and development of, of open source projects, so on. The, the French agency for, for a digital government or corresponding entity, the NUM, they also have a FOSS council where they have external representatives, for example, from Mozilla, from the larger um, foundations like Eclipse um, and, and different vendors and so on and so forth. So they, they go to this council and they get external advice, for example, on the Cyber Resilience Act. They, they are very aware we don't have this, all of these contents in house. But let's get everyone here and help us know how to how to interpret this, and they can help issue different notices that that, that, that can provide further guidance for, in this case, the French public administration. And then one very important aspect we saw across several countries was this means or infrastructure for promoting reuse, which basically was in, in the sense of different kinds of software catalogs promoting and really showcasing, okay, what open source software have we developed, are we using, or could you consider, so on and so forth. Some cases there were more focused on, uh, also on public sector software, so not, doesn't, like in Spain, uh, doesn't have to be open source, but they, they, have, they have, their policy says you should consider software developed by the public sector. So not necessarily open source, but it should be open source and it does meet those conditions. So in, in the case of Spain, it's legally mandated. Before you do anything, you have to look in the repo. You have to look at what others have done. Also in other cases, it's more like in Sweden, we have this authentic code, that we developed from NOSA, which is basically a list 
that we crowdsourced that they, they, you, they can consider and look at. Yeah, and then we have this distinct, distinction between public and, and uh, public software like in Spain, as I mentioned, and open source. And also who maintains these uh, software catalogs like in, in, in France, it's maintained by the ASPO within the NUM, and it's really we maintain through crowdsourcing. And then the level of accessibility, like again in, in Spain, it's limited towards the, the public sector administration, so in Sweden, for example, is open to the public. There's these different levels, facets of, of information. There has been a lot of good work around a metadata standard called Public Code YML, developed, uh, originated from Italy uh, and uh, developed in Italia. And it's been uh, adopted also by France, for example, and spreading, uh, I think, the Commission, the European Commission is also adopting it. So that really enables you to search via GitHub and really get an overview of all the public software that has included this metadata file in their repos. Um, so it, and it, it helps add a lot of information and it enables the search and findability and, and really promoting cross-border collaboration, which is a big hurdle today because a lot of the open source collaboration is nationally focused in build your examples of, of counterpart. And then finally there are some examples, few though, of what we could find among our cases where they're actually also looking at code hosting. Um, so not just listing the uh, these are the projects but really hosting the, the facilities. So here you can go and develop having like a national GitLab instance for example, not go not having to go to GitHub. Um, and then, just briefly, some we were all to, to investigate different uh, success stories, and there, there was uh, quite a few. Exro mentioned where you have Estonia, Finland, and uh, Iceland collaborating on data exchange infrastructure. Signal and uh, Dutch fix my street uh, comparable that's been now being evaluated, for example, in Denmark, and GBSIG, for example, in Spain. What we could see was that among these successful projects that have really grown in adoption and potential also in terms of cross-border collaboration is that they had transitioned into some kind of sustainable maintenance that you can actually find in, in a broader open source community industry ecosystem. Uh, so comparable to, so either like what I talked about earlier, these associations based also, so public sector open source foundations ish stewards or also more uh, the more traditional independent um, open source foundations. Um, again, the recipe here was that these foundations or stewards actually help uh, the community and the public entities to, to pull the money, to create a common governance, to create the processes, to create web ways for them to interact with vendors because these public administrations quite typically doesn't have the technical muscles or the capabilities and as companies do. There are of course exceptions but that's the a rather general note. And also this note of the more capable actors really taking the lead here like for example in, in the Netherlands where we have Amsterdam leading the way in terms of developing the Signal project. Uh, in, um, in Spain, where we have the Great Valencia, Barcelona. In Sweden, where we have Sousa. Uh, in Denmark, where we have Aarhus, Copenhagen, for example. Yeah, and then we won't dive into detail, but here are a few of the recommendations that we provided based on the, on the findings. Uh, I'm not allowed to go into detail, no? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we were also asked to, this was, of course, um, research carried out, it was an assignment from, uh, from the Danish... Uh, government. Right, um, and so we were also asked then to come up with some recommendations, and I think here we draw on what we saw as best practice in these 16 cases, but also I think we drew a bit more widely also on our shared um, expertise and, and, and previous research as well. So um, I think you want to open by saying that you know um, 
we should not look at open source as uh, an end in itself, but really as a way to promote some other uh, principles, goals, values. Um, and I think, I think if we look at the countries um, that we investigated, the, the successful examples really went beyond just saying, right, we should promote open source, and really looked into the way that open source can be used to to promote some of these these um, these other objectives that also maybe more readily translate into uh, appealing to a broader audience. Uh, I think you know again drawing from my experience of speaking about open source to policymakers etc. for um, many years, you know, you start the conversation by talking about open source. This closes a lot of doors, and you know, and somehow turns it into sort of only a technical discussion which a lot of people will sort of uh, draw away from or will sort of um, refer to, 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 to somebody else, etc. So this is really about sort of saying, okay, how can open source be used as a way to promote interoperability and then you need to go beyond what is interoperability. And I think this is something what they've done really well in Estonia. They talk about, they start with sort of what is the achievement, you know, they talk about this like once only principles, things, things like this, things that translate into a user experience. And then, you know, open source is a way to, to, to get there. And so, same thing with uh, sort of digital sovereignty, really talking about sort of uh, starting the conversation or um, talking about some more deeper or more general values when it comes to sort of um, personal data and, and owning the data, etc. Um, I think, and again, sort of showing how open source can be a way to sort of, to, to, to um, you know, to, to promote that. Um, again, um, I think we'll see more people starting talking about, talk about open source AI. Um, and there, I think again, it's an area where we there's a chance to have a broader discussion, talk about values that um, that apply or as are you know that where you can reach a broader audience because it's um, it's seen as something that uh, directly affects um, or has a sort of a consequence for for more fundamental. Um, democratic uh, or civil rights. So, so that's um, the importance about sort of making sure that you don't just um, talk about it being an open source policy, but a policy to promote these deeper uh, or bigger objectives through open source. Right, uh, fell off there. Um, and then you know, we also talk about the need that uh, you want to talk about. And this is something that you hear a lot in the private sector too. There's a lot of research coming out from the Linux Foundation, which really shows that the companies that have explicit policies for um, for consumption and for contribution are also the companies that that see that they are benefiting uh, more from open source. And this can also be translated, I think, to the public sector. It's not enough to have a big uh, statement or endorsement, what does this mean, how does it translate, uh, if somebody else actually wants to do something open source, there needs to be guidelines. And this is, this is something that needs to be developed specifically for the public sector as well. And um, it's something I know that, you know, on the advisory board for the Linux Foundation Europe, and uh, they have put out some research showing that there is a big opportunity for open source in the European public sector. But they're like, why aren't governments sort of joining LF Europe? Um, and I think just finding out what it means, you know, can a government, you know, contribute to an open source project? Uh, I think there are many public sector officials who don't know if that's something that is allowed um, or how they should go about it. Um, so, so having these like clear rules around or guidelines um, uh, is key to 
to going beyond just like a high level endorsement and actually uh, starting to get uh, public sector engagement in open source. Uh, and then, you know, which was not just an explicit focus at the outset of this research, but I think something that I find very interesting is this sort of focusing more explicitly on this um, industrial policy aspect of open source and um, what we saw, for example, in South Korea. But I also think this is what the European Commission is trying to do with some of its uh, funding projects, etc. The Next Generation Internet Fund is also about sort of funding specific um, uh, open source projects. Um, the, the, there are some other um, uh, commission um, initiatives around uh, open strategic autonomy in the cloud, uh, for example, where it also talks about sort of growing the capacity in the in the economy for 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 open source and sort of seeing the strategic value of open source uh, and saying we need to educate more uh, people that uh, can can participate in these sort of innovative ecosystems. We need to um, uh, make sure that our you know, major companies are not just using open source to, to save money, but also start to understand that there's a strategic leveraging that can happen as well. So um, that, I think, is something that we see as a, as a, as a, as a potential for future investigation. I'm guessing we're approaching time, so I'll sum it up. I'd just like to add, uh, Germany is a very interesting example in this case as well, where they have the Southern Tick Fund, where they are actually going out trying to fund projects like Curve, for example, by Donald Dennis Denver. We'll find these infrastructure projects that are important. And where they also have their National Center for Digital Sovereignty, where they are collaborating with developers, for example, Next Cloud Elements supporting them and helping them to, to put together uh, a sovereign tech suite, office desk suite, or call open desk, for example, uh, to grow sovereign uh, counterparts to, to traditional proprietary alternatives. So I'll speed through, but I, I don't think this will be any like news flash from, uh, based on the presentation, but consider adopting an ASPA on the national level, provide guidance, um, uh, find these neutral areas where you can actually collaborate through projects like just like in, in industry that does in, in the uh, open source foundations. Those more capable than others needs to take a step forward. Um, and we, we need to establish guidelines, really help in the translation from policy to actual Swedish or whatever language that you have in, in that country to Okay, what does this mean in practice for someone who works in a municipality uh, with 2,000 people? How can I interpret this and apply this on, this on my local level? Invest in training nationally on all levels some different uh, perspectives. Create an overview of what's out there and promote, promote it and enable collaboration based on, on, uh, on new products and so on. And just ending, what we, what we, did, what we did not see we saw a lot of good things there, a lot of good examples, and we hope we, thought we captured most of them in our recommendations. But what we did not see was this more future-looking perspective. Um, there was the digital indices that we found, that we used, noted, open source, somewhat in different contexts, but there wasn't really anything that provided guidance or enabled the measurement and, and comparison about how different countries use open source as an instrument in their ongoing work, in their digital transformation, so on and so forth. So we really hope that in the future that these different things, because they are quite valuable, even though they seem quite, yeah, repeating themselves, but a lot of countries and national administration, they use these indices when steering and planning. So if we can get things like this in there, it will, we will have a more positive effect in the long term going forward. Okay, thanks. I already see two hands for asking. <laughs> I'm not going to go in the back, right? <laughs> 
Thank you. Your focus was, of course, on open source, uh, but I'm curious about free software. If you come up with anything about interest in software freedom, and I think it will overlap with digital sovereignty, but um, I'm imagining a focus on any user freedom could lead to priorities. For example, if the goal is freedom and not efficiency, you might focus on maybe you might decide that it's more important to focus on software that ordinary citizens direct, but like maybe train ticket machines instead of maybe a back end database for uh, some, some authority. Um, just, just a, that's just one example of some idea that maybe wouldn't come up. But, did, so did you um, come up with any, any explicit focus maybe on end user freedoms? I just have a short comment. Yeah, um, sure. I think, you know, we had a specific assignment and actually the, the assignment was more about the software we use um, and from a public sector <coughs> perspective. So I think that guided our, our research and I think it's also driven by the fact that um, there is an interoperable Europe Act which is coming to force now which focuses on sort of interoperability and and reuse, and it comes out of um, this European Union focus on share and reuse within public sector. So it's it's a more narrow concept, obviously, than than open source or, or free software. Um, but that was in the assignment, so I think that kind of guided our. We, we broadened it a little bit, and I think naturally, from our perspective, uh, we it became more about looking at open source. Um, but yeah, if you want. To, yeah, I mean, yeah. we, we captured it. I mean, there were closest, I mean, there was a lot, a lot of focus on transparency, for example, and public, public code, a lot of uh, iterated through the, through the people we talked to on the campus, but yeah, this was the, the scope we were given. I hear a lot uh, talking about sovereignty, but really, what does it mean for free and open software? Uh, we don't have borders, so. It looks like it's more like a button to push for policymakers than anything else. I have a lot of <laughs> thoughts around this. <laughs> That's a um, it's important to have a button too, right? because it's important, uh, you know, unless you have some of these big uh, geopolitical worries or whatever, nobody wants to talk about it. And so, on. <coughs> um, so I think, you know, I. I like when there is some big button you can you can you can push, but um, on the other hand, um, it's not about um, the the question of digital sovereignty. Yes, we could have had just a paper that talked about what is digital sovereignty, is it open strategic autonomy, is it uh, technological independence, is it what is it? Um, and the way I personally approach it is that it has. It's, it's a new focus of policymakers, but for me it comes down to user uh, freedom. And it should not be different from being sort of um, the importance of being having independence to work towards a specific vendor, regardless of, it, of whether it's a European company or an American company. It's about sort of, to some extent, having the user having some kind of autonomy uh, over its digital assets, um, then you know it can help to, to link it to this to this uh, to this um, geopolitical discussion. But um, I, I prefer to, to think of it in, in this way. I mean it's really maybe simplifying but it's so that we're talking about avoiding locking be it to a vendor uh, locally or nationally or internationally. I mean that's one of the key benefits with open source. Ideally, is that under the right conditions, you're not locked into a specific vendor or a specific context. And open source is one instrument, open standards is another, where you can use these tools to enable interoperable solutions cross border, but you can also use them to avoid locking, be it a Swedish vendor or a Chinese or American vendor. Uh, or you might want to explore different options if that political climate in that context would, would change. But it, it, uh, it does that. Um, I think there's a dangerous uh, discourse, at least from my personal perspective, when I hear a lot about people talking about European open source software and not open source software. 
or freedom of the source software. There is not, in my opinion, there is nothing European open source software. There can be a European open source vendor driving its community, or there can be a mainly Eurocentric community looking at the people in that community, but it might as easily spread to be a African European or I mean I think a community is defined by who's in there. So I think that, that it's a dangerous discourse. I hear it a lot about yeah. European open source and uh, also true and, and fake open source. But I think you can talk so. about having a European competence, for example. So I think um, that's more valuable. You know, the technology is not European. Uh, the code is not European, but I think from if you are a a policymaker, a politician, it might be interesting to know, well, okay, if we, what, you know, do we have the competence to keep using, developing, maintaining this software if, you know, if the situation becomes, you know, if the international geopolitical situation worsens. And so it's about sort of do we have the, the competence uh, in Europe? Do we also, if we look at sort of, uh, do we have, and this becomes an industrial policy thing that I mentioned, are, do we have companies that, you know, can strategically take advantage of this um, to sort of, um, it's also important for economic growth. I mean, it's just us looking at it. If if you're a company and you're, we're talking about a key technology here that you are very dependent on for your business or you to survive, then you want to have people in there contributing, driving your agenda in competition with the others. You want to see that your use case, your agenda is in line with where, where that project is heading. And you want to be sure that a competitor doesn't come in and drive it in another direction. I mean, same thing here. That if you as a country, you're dependent on these key open source technologies, then you need to see, that, see to it that you have the competency, that you have the companies, that you have the people that are in there, and ensuring your agenda, ensuring your use case to use these open source technologies from, from your, how you want to use it. So it's not, nothing different, it's just different wordings and context, essentially. One more question before lunch. I see one more question. So a few weeks ago there was this famous uh, supply chain attack affecting open source software. And uh, you were mentioning that one of the parameters of which you perform into the evaluation is called Open source software is seen as a way to provide security to software. Have you seen any changes uh, after this attack on the way that the open source software is presided by public institutions? Could, could you repeat that question? Yes. I'm, I'm going close, I'm not sure that, that's <laughs> that does anything. Right? How, after the, the compromise of the, the XZ library, have you seen any change on how open source software is presided regarding security at public institutions? Um, no, I would say it's, I think it's increasingly being more and more, uh, as in, our, in our investigation, it, it was only, I think it's from the country side, I mm -hmm. think it was only France that security was actually highlighted and where the, the national uh, cyber security uh, agency uh, is called that actually had a policy in promoting and uh, seeing this. I think Luxembourg had their house of cyber security as well. So I think in that context they are very aware of uh, the need for transparency and an open source. But there was very little in, in terms of we need to contribute to sustain and, and improve the quality, improve the maintenance, and show that we have enough ice in the coat, uh, and so on and so forth. There was very little wording on that. Uh, I would personally have loved to, to see more there. Um, as we mentioned, there are initiatives like the Sovereign Tech Fund um, in, in Germany and, and the 
initiatives from the European level. But uh, I think Japan, um, in Japan, there is a I think METI, which is the yeah, Ministry for European no, <laughs> Economic and uh, Trade. Or, I shouldn't have said that because I don't remember what the acronym stands for. But in any case. Um, that was quite interesting because they didn't specifically look at, they just said, take for granted that open source is, is widespread, you know, used wise, you know, there's widespread use. And they came together to sort of write uh, guidance for how, you know, how the, the, the Japanese industry should, should, um, should consider this. And so there it was sort of the government taking responsibility for, for the, the private sector use of open source. Uh, by uh, looking at case studies, uh, case studies and best practice, etc. But uh, that's one of the examples. I think so. Thank you. And I think we're running out of time. So I saw one more. I'm very Delay lunch <laughs> for five minutes. Uh, working with uh, open source in the global south, uh, we see that uh, governments have great interest in adopting open source, but there is a challenge both with the uh, cooperation and uh, governance on the open source side. You know, it becomes a bit wild west, you can select any library you want and use it and open. Your recommendation be uh, for a country that would like to start using open source as maybe the, the three top points uh, to do in order to have a sustainable adoption of open source. I'm thinking, so you can, <laughs> or you're also thinking. So, so more for countries to start using open source. Yeah. So it's really about, okay, what do we want to gain from it? Why do we want to use open source? So not just we need to start using open source, it's okay, what do you want to achieve from it? I'm guessing like maybe more cost efficient solutions and, and maybe potential to tailor it for example could be one reason. A more interoperable solution and a community of, of practice uh, that could contribute could be another. I mean why the why question needs to come first, then there's the how. And typically public sector administration doesn't have the capabilities and I don't know, I don't want to generalize about, about developing countries, but maybe that, that one, one perspective was that they could have less technical capabilities, so how can we ensure that even more? Um, and really, for how can we leverage the, the more collaboration in terms of this more international focus? There is the Digital Public Good, Goods Alliance, for example, that takes open source projects and certifies them and highlights different projects that are suitable for and there's the government tech stack I believe where they're trying to gather projects that, that, can, that can provide a, a suitable solution and there is a lot of drive here in my European countries especially from the digital sovereign perspective uh, like, like in, in, um, in Germany as I mentioned with the open desk solution where they are taking single vendor open source projects creating the glue and putting these together so that you have a basic a, a whole open desk suite which should be transferable to, to their context as well. So it, it wasn't because I didn't want to answer the question actually if it's like look it up but I really wanted to think about it because I was involved in organizing a conference about open source um, uh, for public good, um, which was held at the UN headquarters last uh, summer, and we are now getting ready to have a second uh, conference that will be held in July also at uh, the UN headquarters. And last year, of course, we were told because most of the participants in the conference they are from Europe or the US, and you know, by the UN people. We are also encouraged to think about how do we make sure that the global south is in, you know. Uh, gets to also um, participate and, and, and benefit. And so um, there are, I think, the World Bank is actually one of the, has been one of the forerunners, I think, in promoting open source. So one way is, of course, to kind of, through an existing program, 
I know that UNICEF, for example, is also a big user of, uh, of open source software, and then it has to do, they develop sometimes and maintain specific uh, solutions that can be used for like in crisis situations or for certain things, and which, you know, are available in open source. So, but I think what the takeaway that we had is really about how do we develop the, the, the expertise in, in these countries. How do we really benefit? How do they really benefit from being able to learn by participating in open innovation in this way? Like how? So I think because if you look at the sustainable development goals, it's all about sort of having also place-based learning and, and building capabilities uh, at the local level, etc. And I, I think you know these. Uh, so so from a country perspective, I think there are some existing. Um, uh, very good initiatives with the World Bank and ITU and you know many different uh, initiatives but also I think from the sort of something that I tell the, the foundations like the Linux Foundation etc it has to do with this it also has to do with this inclusivity the work that they're doing with it being more inclusive in their uh, communities also to like extend this more explicitly um, and consciously to, to towards sort of the global south um, you know so it has to do more about being welcoming and inclusive I think just a quick note is also so good so look that up it's a conference and then also the ITU and UNDP recently launched a, a program where they are promoting or helping to establish national government hospitals in, in developing countries. So just as an example. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.